<laughs> How do you discover the letters in the conscience subject as why? Well? This was a long story. Um, I've published a lot of First World War research of my own, um, public publishing history and history of individual writers. <clears throat> and when I was doing that, I had a visiting research fellowship at the University of Reading, but I lived abroad. So I used to come to Reading for maybe three or four days every month to do my research, use the archives, see um, colleagues and whatnot. And the people I was staying with were Tom and Elizabeth Haderman, who are Quakers. I'm also a Quaker. So I knew Tom through Quaker meetings that we had, we, uh, committee meetings we had in common. And he said, oh, come and stay with us. We have a spare room. You can use our daughter's room. It'll be fine, because they're about my parents' age. So I stayed with them, and that was lovely. And we became friends, as well as capital F, Quaker friends. And then one evening, Elizabeth said, would you like to read the letters that my grandparents wrote to each other during the First World War? because he was a conscientious objector. And I thought, yes, give me these letters, because it's very rare to get a, an unexplored, unstudied archive and to have full access to it. So I read the letters. It took me a long time because there were 200,000 words. Um, these were typed up from the originals um, because Tom and one of their daughters and Elizabeth's sister, Julia, had typed the letters over about 20, 30 years. So the family would have the collection, because the letters themselves were getting very faded. They were mostly written on pencil, on very old paper, 100 years old, as you know. So that was very exciting, and I thought, right, we have to get these published, we have to get this story out. This is so important, because a conscientious objector's story is important. But these letters were really, I thought, much more about the wife, and that was unique. I've never seen any kind of historical account by women about the experience of being in a conscientious objector's family. Mm. So I wrote a, a short article about them for a history magazine and they said, nah, no, we'd prefer you to write the article about all the wives of all the conscientious objectors. And I thought, oh, I can't do that. That's No, that's not my, my thing. I tried to present the letters as a book to various history publishers and the main response I got when they bothered to reply was, we'd prefer you to write about something more saleable, perhaps all the conscientious objectors in Hertfordshire, which is where these people came from. And I thought, oh, no, I can't do it. So there the project lay. Scroll forward a few years, I had turned into a publisher, and I knew that I wanted to publish this as a book. So Tom and Elizabeth and the family gave me full permission. I edited the stories down to about 50% of the length that the original texts were. And I made Lucy's story, Lucy Sunderland, the gold thread of narrative that would take you through the war from 1916, when Frank gave himself up, right through to the end, when he was returned from prison. Fantastic. That's lovely. Um, so, who, who was she, the, um, the, the wife? Can you tell a little bit about what we okay. have? Okay, well, Frank and Lucy were a working-class couple. They had married in London, but they moved to Letchworth, which was a garden city. Very forward-thinking, very progressive, and they moved there because they wanted um, a better life for their children. They wanted to live among people whose values they shared in this case, Quaker values and utopian values of making a better society for all, without class, without any barriers. Um, Lucy was a, a, se a seamstress. She uh, trained with a tailor, so she did tailoring. And one of the reasons she was able to keep herself and the children alive during the war was that she took in sewing. And she was a very good seamstress. Frank had a collection of different jobs. Before he turned himself into the military authorities, he had been a collector of insurance premiums, which was a standard job at the time, and he also did lots of carpentry and woodwork. After the war ended, he was supported by George Bernard Shaw to set himself up as a picture framer. And that was his job pretty much until he died. Wow. So interesting, interesting little connection there, yeah. isn't it? Um, what's the, sort of the tone of the letters and the major, major sort of, <laughs> how would you describe the tone of them? Um, friendly, affectionate, loving, respectful, very wistful, Occasionally frustrated, especially from Frank, but who wouldn't be, trapped for two and a half years in a variety of prisons. And there is one very despairing section when Lucy has a personal bereavement and she has to get through it on her own because her husband's in prison and she and the children have to make the best of it and just get on. And after that, there's a wonderful lyrical section where she decides, I've had enough of hearing the bombs over London, because from Letchworth they could hear the bombing. I'm going to go to the countryside. So she sublet their cottage and moved with the children to Devon, to Barnstable, for about three months. 
and the letters suddenly transform into lyrical happiness. She's writing for once, not about, I don't know what we're going to eat or we've only got three eggs this morning, to isn't it fabulous out here, the countryside, the weather, the beauty. I'm doing all this reading, the children are loving their new school. It, was just, it just changed her. And then she comes back. Mm. So what, just to, the, the, the history of Conscious Subjects, is what, how, how long was he in prison? I mean, it was, it was two and a half years, but mm. what, what was the, sort of the story of, of him? Was it different prisons he was in? Where, where was he? He was initially in Bedford Prison, and then he was taken to Wandsworth, and then, I think, returned to Bedford after a while. <clears throat> so really only two prisons. He didn't have to go to Wormwood Scrubs. Mm. He wasn't sent to Dartmoor or even to Dice in Aberdeenshire, which was... Those Dartmoor and Dice were the two principal centres where the COs were sent to do hard labour. But he was an older man. Um, he was in his 40s. And also he was, he was an absolutist. He refused to do anything that might help the war effort. So this um, went down as far as not taking a clerical job, not helping in the ambulance service. He simply refused to do anything and he wanted to stop the war in his own way by being a blockage in the military authorities, by forcing them to house him and feed him <clears throat> because that was their duty. They had put him in prison, they had to maintain him. Did they all go to prison with people who refused to fight? Was that, was that, was that his there history? There were degrees. Mm -hmm. um, he was the, one in the most extreme category, but you would have men who refused to carry arms but would serve on the front as ambulance drivers and stretcher bearers, messengers. Mm. John Buchan, again, wrote a novel, um, Mr Stanfast, which has one of its principal characters, is a pacifist from a Quaker background who refuses to fight but does eventually join the army as a messenger, refuses to carry arms and dies tragically as a hero because he's behaved with all the valour that the soldier did, had, but um, will not fight. And what happened to him at the end? Do we know whether he re reunited Frank. with his wife? With... Um, yes, they built a house in Letchworth of their own. They brought their children up there. Their middle daughter married the boy next door, and that was Elizabeth's parents. And Frank died in the late 50s, I think, and Dora, not Dora, um, Lucy survived him by about 10 years, but I'm not quite sure about right. that. Right, yeah, that's nice. Um, um, why, what, what makes it such an important historical record, do you think, with the letters? It's a story of a working class woman on the home front, that's the most important thing, because there is so little written by women. Women's voices in general in history are very rare, either because they could not write, or if they were working class and could write, they were too busy working. There was no time to write. These letters are unique because she had the occasion and the need to write because her husband was in prison. So that was a natural, automatic exchange of letters. If he had not been a conscientious objector and had fought, there may have been some letters, but hardly any, because soldiers were far more restricted in what they could write and how, how often they could write. Um, so it's a, an extraordinary survival from the First World War and its circumstances that made these letters possible. The letters are an extraordinary record of domestic life mm. and what it was like day to day with rations, with the privations, what you did when you got ill, what do you do when your child's got scarlet fever, all these things, which you just don't get much evidence of. This is primary evidence for a historian. Fantastic. Um, and 2019 is a major anniversary of the CEO's release, isn't mm. that coming up? Um, is that... Is that, that is, that's yeah, April 1919 is when all the conscientious objectors were released. They had to wait for five months after the end of the war right. before the War Office decided they could be released. Right, and Frank was one of those. He he came out with yeah. them. Yeah, excellent. Um, so if you had to sum up why what to about this, but why would why did you want to publish it? Why did I want to? Because yeah. it was an extraordinary historical story that hadn't been told. It was there saying, "Publish me now." Yeah. There was no other reason really. Fantastic. That's lovely. Thank you very much.